So great. Let's uh so the agenda of today is really I will start with talk about what are the best practices when we design schema. And then I will talk about the system architecture, how the data is stored under under the hood and how our MPP massive parallel process process works. And then uh, we, I'll talk about the mechanism select statement, how it works exactly, right? What happens under the hood? And then I will bring up a few points on the uh, query writing best practices. Yeah, because understanding how the system works really is very important because the, the, usually the best queries, the queries follows the best practices, follows the, the, the way that how how this how the engine can run the fastest fastest right okay now let's start with the uh, query uh, schema schema definition best practices okay so this is one of the most frequently asked question we have different options we we'll define an edge type from the schema right uh, Uh, so 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 we have undirected edge, we have directed edge, and uh, so 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 a frequently asked the question is like how 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 should I make the decision, right? We know that the undirected edge is about like we can traverse between the two vertices in the uh, uh, the any directions, right? You can go from A to B and B to A. Basically, under the hood, the edge is stored twice, once for A and once for B, so that you can go back both directions. Well, on the other hand, the directed edge is only stored for its originating vertex. So that means if we have an edge from A to B, so the edge is only stored for A. Okay, and we also have a definition called a reverse edge. So reverse edge for, is under a different type, pointing in the reverse direction of the directed edge, right? So you can go both ways with a reverse edge. Then the question is, how do we make the decision to choose from, to, 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 to use the undirected edge or directed edge, right? Okay, so there are, is, there are different pros and cons for different types. For example, the undirected edge is um, very simple to use. When you write the queries, just use whatever type you got there, right? It's undirected. And uh, but the thing is, it doesn't contain any uh, directional info, okay? When your query is direct, if direction really matters, it won't work for you. I will give you an example very soon, okay? And then for directed edge, if you only have directed edge without the reverse edge, that means you, you only can go one direction. You can never go back to, go back from B back to A, right? Because we only store it to edge once. However, the benefit you can get from it is like that you can, you only use half of the memory as uh, then the undirected edge, right? And also then we have directed edge and the reverse edge, memory wise, the same as undirected edge. However, there's an actual type. Sometimes when the actual, when direction is, doesn't matter, the actual type will, introduce more complexity during your query writing, right? But when direction matters, it will make things work, okay? So this is an example, like uh, explaining why uh, undirected edge can make your query easier, right? For example, I want to traverse something like a, find the user serve the same email, right? Then the traversal path will be user, email, user, two hops. Right. In that case, um, if we if we define the edge between user and email as undirected edge, the query can be pretty concise, right? However, if you use reverse edge, you always have to, you always have to think about the direction. Oh, I'm starting from the user. I'm going to the email. Okay, I want to use user has email type. Oh, now I'm starting from the email, going to the user. Now I have to use the other type. You always have to you always have to think about that during your query writing. So it's more complex to write the query uh, than using the undirected edge. So this is really the benefit of undirected edge. And the, what's the limit of undirected edge? It's like when you ask the question, mm, now I have an enterprise graph. Okay. The enterprise is actually one company is the parent company of of like a company A is a parent company of company B, 
this kind of relationship is directed, right? So direction actually matters here. So if we ask a question, okay, given the company, I want to find the ultimate parent company. That means I want to find the parent company of the parent company, right? And the, all the way to the top. In that case, if we define the graph relationship in the undirected way, then like say, let's, let's say, what's the ultimate parent for C4? Oh, there's no way to tell, right? Because we don't know if C2 is the parent of C4 or C7 is the parent. There's no such info stored on the edge. In this way, in this case, we have to define the edge in the direct the edge and the reverse edge, right? This way we can traverse the red arrow, the red edge all the way to the top to find the ultimate parent company, right? So the rule of thumb is really when we choose a edge type here, the rule of thumb is really if your source node and the target node, they are under different types, then use undirected edge, right? If your, your, your source node and target node, they are in the same type and the direction matters, use directed edge with reverse edge, okay? Because if your source node and this target node are under different type, using undirected edge is always safe because you already have the direction and info on the vertex, you can tell the direction based on the vertex type, is they're different, right? Then uh, that also can make, make your query writing easy. However, if the source and target are, are the same time and the direction matters, then we have to choose the later, the directed edge with reverse edge, okay? Yeah, just feel free to post your questions in the, in the chat. I really love to see questions and answer questions, okay? And uh, another thing is, Let's say if we have a lot of columns in the table, and the one sometimes the big question is for a specific column, should it really be a vertex or should it should it be a property or attribute on the vertex? Right? Now let's think about what's the difference. If a column is frequently used as a searching condition, like for example, I have a product table, I always want to get the, the result like a now I, I, I want to get all the products with Apple products, right? So if we define it as attribute without the indexes, that means if we do such search, it will be a full table scan or a full vertex type scan, right? Then that's uh, even this in parallel, but it's still not very effective, not very fast, right? So you have scan, scan so many vertexes. And uh, another use case would be, I want to, given product A, I want to find other products that shares the same color, right? So imagine if in this case, we, uh, uh, well, we don't have this color vertex created in the middle associating both of the products, like say given product one, find whoever shares the same color, right? If we define the vertex, we can easily find the other products with the two hop traversal. However, without this one in the middle, then we have to scan over all the other products to find the ones which share the same attribute, right? So the, so the basic idea here is like, a, whenever you are frequently searching for a specific attribute or you use some attribute to find the other entities that share the same attribute, then it's a good, it can be a good decision to create a vertex out of them, right? So in this case, we have created the vertex type for brand, color, and type, because we want, we frequently want to search based on those, those values, or we want to find that the other product shares the same property, okay? Then that does give us a, the motivation to create them as vertexes. And alternatively, we can also create the indexes also out of those attributes so that you don't need a vertex in the middle or we can, we can create the indexes as well. However, indexes is different the implementation as you create the vertex because fundamentals, they are different because indexes most of the time it will be on disk, right? And also there will be a little cache storing those indexes. And then when you look up, it follows the R tree, not R tree, B tree structure. 
like the, the multiple layer lookup to find the vertexes you are you are trying to get, right? So performance wise, um, creating vertexes will be better. However, storage wise, index is 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 is, idea, is, is more memory efficient, right? Is there any downside? Uh, I got a question. Is there any downside of creating multiple vertex in graph performance wise? I think here you are referring to multiple vertex types, right? So um, let me think. So uh, if we have too many vertex types, there will be some impact, but it is not like a query performance wise. It's more on the like a metadata management level. If you have too many vertex types, I believe it will slow down your query installation because during the uh, semantic check or data type check, it, ha it has to go over a lot of types to validate the query. That will definitely slow down the query installation process. But the query traversal wise, I, I believe there is no major impact because if you have a lot of vertex types, that will result in more multiple a lot of more partitions under the hood in the at the data level, right? But having more partitions is actually a, a, a natural behavior the system have. It's, it already has a lot of partitions. So that's, I think the impact there should be minor. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, okay? If it doesn't, please follow up. So, so the decision here, the rule of sum making this decision is if we all see memory, and uh, less care about the performance, use the index. If you care, if, if performance is, is about everything, create a vertex, right? If you don't use it much, only for display, just leave it as a property. Okay, that's that. And this is another frequently asked questions for schema design. That is, mm, how do we handle multiple relationships under the same type between two vertexes? Because this is a, a limited by one of the feature of Tiger Graph, that is between two vertexes for the same edge type, you can only have one edge, okay? So between two vertexes for the same edge, you can only have one type, okay? That means if you have multiple transactions between two users, then we can either be fine with method one that is define multiple transaction vertexes, or we aggregate all the info into one edge. We have these two different options. Now let's, now let's discuss what are the pros and cons of the, these two different options, okay? So the pros of this, of, of the method one is really, it's easier for you to do transactional analytic. For example, you are an uh, anti-fraud use case and the, your fraud label is at the transaction level, then this is, would be ideal, right? Then you have the uh, transaction vertexes as a vertex actualized as vertexes, right? So in this case, um, uh, you can do a, a lot of uh, you can do a lot of like a transaction level analytics because they are vertexes. You can find the similar transactions. You have the vertex here, and the, but the cost is really the cost is it use more memory to store these transaction vertexes. And uh, now you between users is two hops away, right? And uh, the other method is like we store. For example, we can store a list of date so that we don't lose data, or you can just store the aggregated value, say total amount, first day, last date, right? Uh, some, some of the use cases, they are acceptable. Some, some use cases, losing information is not acceptable, okay? And uh, so the pros is really, is, it has significantly less memory usage. You just take one step between users. That makes things a lot easier. However, if you want to store all the dates or the all the transactions into a list. The list is not very performant, right? As we all know, generally any programming language, a collection type will slow you down, right? So updating and insert the list is a uh, is slower, and the, that will also uh, impact your real time query performance. Okay, so uh, actually. 
for most of the cases, this schema on the left hand is recommended. However, if you accept losing some info and aggregate the edge, this will be recommended. Okay. That's the uh, right. I don't think we got enough time to cover everything, so let's skip this. So, but I can talk about the high level idea. So, the schema design is really based on two things. First is the data we have, right? What data columns we have? Um, what, uh, um, like, under your use case? Two things, right? Data columns, what the data you have, and uh, what use case you want to do. So sometimes we need to think about both. From the data perspective, like you cannot define an edge across the table. That's the only tape uh, limitation you have. You can intuitively create the, the schema, right? But later we'll consider about your use case. You need to define a schema that serves the purpose of your use case. Because some of the schema design uh, serves one use case, some of the schema design serves another use case. So we need to consider that, take that into consideration. Okay, now let's uh, talk about the distributed native scrap storage, how the graph is stored under the hood. Okay, so under the hood, we actually have three types of data. The first one is the, we call the ID service. ID service is a bi-directional mapping from the external ID to the internal ID. For external ID, I think everybody knows it. It's a uh, is a primary string ID, right? User runs this way, whatever your account number, transaction number is, which has been used as a primary ID. And the internal ID is served as an index, or it can be with the internal ID, we can easily calculate where the vertex is, where the attribute of the vertex is, where the neighbors of the vertex is in the system. Because in the system, the storage has two parts. This is called GSE, right? If you know the paragraph process names. And this part is called a GPE, right? Basically, inside of GPE is where we store the graph, where the graph is stored. However, this graph topology is stored in the internal format. That means inside of the graph topology, every vertex is stored in the integer type value, right? So, so that we can easily find the location of the vertexes, easily find the location of their, their neighbors. So in GPE, we have two types of data, very straightforward, vertex and edges. And in vertex partitions, basically we store the vertex info, right? The vertex internal ID and the vertex attributes, the name, the age, the email, whatever, right? And now edge partitions, basically we store all the neighbors of a vertex along with their edge attributes, because on the edge, we can have a list of edge attributes, right? So basically that's the three type of data, data under the hood, the ID mapping from the external ID to internal ID and the vertex and the, with their attributes, neighbors or relationships with the attributes, three type of data. Okay, so with these three type of data, this is how we store the data distributedly. Okay, uh, so you can see that uh, each type of data, they are segmented, they are split into segments, and they are also stored distributedly across the servers. Okay, let's assume we have three servers storing the data distributedly, and then Another thing is the segment also have a, a second number, right? The segments with the same number will be stored on the same server. So that means for a specific vertex, you can find its ID info, vertex info, and the edge info from the same server, okay? And to, in order to find, you can use its internal ID to find all the info needed. So this is how the, uh, a graph is stored under the hood. Okay, if you got any questions, uh, just uh, post it in the chat. I'd be very happy to interact with you and answer your questions. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is how the data is stored. And now let, I'll, I'll talk about how the MPP 
is performed. MPP is uh, so, so so again. Let's look at the, this is how the these are the data, right? And then let's assume we have a we have a CPU have eight cores. Usually, Tiger Graph would try to uh, parallelize your computations. We are a massive parallel processing platform, right? So one thing unique about Tiger Graph is like the vertexes. The vertexes, the edges here, here and here, they are not just uh, data records. They're not just the data. They are also computational unit. That means when we run the select statement, when you run the graph traversal, we, all of the vertex and the edges has been selected. They will participate in the calculation in parallel, okay? I, if I select the millions of vertexes, millions of edges, they will all run some, execute some logic on the vertex and the edges in parallel and distributively. So that's the beauty of tag graph, how we run things really fast, right? So now let's say if we have a server with eight CPU cores and then we want to execute the select statement like this, I want to start from all the users. I I run some logic under post queue. So post queue here means I want to execute some logic for every each user selected. Okay, so logic can be anything. So that means all the users selected will be performs some logic in parallel. Okay, so first the thing we do is remember the green ones are the vertex partitions. We find those user vertex partitions or segments, and then we sign a CPU thread. Or CPU core to every each uh, partition selected up to the number of CPU cores. Usually, if you have eight CPU cores, we will have eight thread in the thread pool. Okay, and then every partition will be pro processed in, in parallel. However, now you you may be able to tell. So the data, the vertex is inside those six, same segment. They will be processed sequentially, right? Okay, so this is how we handle the uh, post queue process. And uh, same way, if we like say, now I want to get traverse all the edges attached to those user vertexes. Now we have an edge defined here, right? And then now the logic is defined under a queue clause. So a queue clause really means I want to run this logic for every edge being selected in parallel, okay? So the first thing is, again, we find those edge segments of those user vertexes, and then we assign the CPU cores to every segment. Sometimes we have a lot more segments that needs to be processed than the CPU core. Then the thread will, then for one thread, it, after done processing this segment, right, it will move to the next and process the ones. Also in the same way, if we have multiple servers, then this process just happens on multiple servers in parallel and distributely. Hmm. And another thing I think worth to mention is to allow all those vertexes and the edges to run in parallel without confliction, without any recent conditions or computations on the resource, we actually adopted a map reduce model so that when the edges, they run the logic you defined, they all run in parallel in the map reduce way. So you can consider each job on the map is a map function. And then after, while, after that, there is a hidden um, aggregation phase to aggregate the message has been sent to the same variable. I'll talk to that later, okay? And uh, in Tiger Graph, we also have two execution mode. So when you run the query, you run the query like a, a, like this, right? Uh, wait, it? Upgrade query Q1 something for graph graph name, right? So by default, it actually follows the single server mode. What does single server mode mean? That means if let's say in this case, server two received the request. And then, the, but the server two, let's say we have three servers, each server stores part of the graph, right? Server two doesn't have the entire graph in order to finish the query logic and the traversal. Then in this case, server two have to 
get whatever missing from server two for this query from server one and server three. And then server two got enough information to process the query and handles it on this server two only. All the calculations are, are, are happens on server two. So this is a single server mode. So there's the one thing we definitely don't want to do for single server mode. That is, if your query starts from all the vertexes, don't do it. Because that means server two will ask for all the graph from server one, the server three to the same server, and hopefully you'll go out of memory, right? And uh, on the other hand, we have this distributed mode. When we define the distributed query, you do it like this. It is distributed query, not query. Uh, oh, query, yes. Query Q2 and the, the rest of the stuff, right? So this will make your query executed in the distributed mode. Distributed mode is for the large queries, for the query that starts from really huge amount of vertices. In, in distributed mode, each server will handle the data stored on itself. It will handle the vertex and the edges selected and stored on server one by server one, right? And uh, so, so the, everything happens in distributedly on all servers. Each server take care of their own data and they would communicate to synchronize the runtime variables, your local accumulators, um, namely uh, vertex attached accumulators and the, the global accumulators. Right, so this is distributed mode. So this is good when you want to run some large scale queries with many, uh, like a like a, you have a very huge number of works selected. Sometimes like a distributed mode will make your performance run even faster. We have benchmark running those large processings, like adding more mode and run distributed uh, mode will actually outperform the performance of single node. When the uh, when the number of vertices is selected uh, reach a certain level, okay. So that's that. So uh, this is a actually system architecture describing how th the system works when we process large amount of data. Um, so this is important because we want to make sure things. This is highly related to the query writing best practice because only when we make sure the system runs the way it's designed is fast, right? We want to make sure the system runs as parallel as possible. We want to make sure that the, all the vertex and the edges, they, they traverse in the top speed, right? Okay. And then now let's talk about how select, oh, I got a question. Do we have a difference in the way we use local global in a single or? Oh yes, that's a that's a great, great question. The question is, do we have a difference when we run, when we use local accumulator and the global accumulator in the single mode query with distributed query? That's a very, very good question. So uh, I don't have a slide to explain that. So I will just annotate, right? Let's assume we have three, three servers. Right, and then in our query, we define say create a distributed query. Uh, let's again two. Right. And in the query, we define some like say um, max accum will be integer, call the whatever max. Right. So if we have a global variable like this like this max value, right? Then some of the value will be contributed from server one and some of the value will be contributed from server two and some from server three, right? So that means in the end of the select statement, if you have updated this max value, that means it will be aggregated at your sum node, right? And then the aggregated value will be also Copy it to other servers. So it follows some steps in order to aggregate and synchronize the value among the cluster. So that means in your distributed mode, if you have a very large collection type of global accumulator, that will be very heavy. 
because the same the same the same large collection will be copied to other servers as well. And also in distributed mode, if you, you can also define something like this, right? You can say, well, I want a list of vertex and uh, this is a local accumulator, right? Uh, called just list. In this case, sometimes we, have, we, we may have a select statement, say, uh, R equals uh, T from blah, blah, blah. And then in the accumulator, I say, uh, accumulate T at list plus equal S dot list. The, the, basically, that means we are sending the value of the source vertex to the target vertex, right? So that will require some shuffling. We need to, if, if, as, uh, if the target vertex is remote, that means we need to do some shuffling in order to send the, the messages to that list of the target vertex, okay? And another thing that is very worth to mention here is also highly related to the query writing best practice. It's the target attribute. It's not the accumulator, however, the target attribute, okay? So the target attribute is a lot more expensive than source attribute or edge attribute. The reason is we you select a whole bunch of edges and you want to access to its target attribute, that means the, edge, the edge target attribute can be anywhere, right? It can, it can be locally on this server. It can also be on other servers. That means, and it can be also be in any hardening partitions. And so that there will be a lot, of, a lot of shufflings needed in order to access the target attributes, right? So that's another thing that is different when you write a distributed mode query. You can usually try to avoid accessing target attribute Try to avoid uh, re to oper uh, try to avoid define a global accumulator that is super large, and also try to avoid uh, um, the operations that result in sufferings. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, I got another question. I, I've been applying several positions rather than the current year, but I haven't received a prompt response as. Uh, Okay, uh, so let me, uh, okay, let's uh, go to the, uh, how select statement works, right? Now we know that all the edges have traversal happens in parallel. Now let's talk about accumulators, how accumulators works, right? Usually all accumulators operations happens in two steps. Uh, two steps, the first step, it's like the, the vertex and the edges will send the messages or new values to the accumulator and the accumulator will keep them in the bucket. And then the second phase is to aggregate the values in the bucket to a new value. Let's assume we have some queue, then we aggregate all the messages to a sum queue. Okay, this is how accumulators works. And uh, it follows two steps. It's kind of like a, uh, if we take a metaphor, it's like a, in the classroom, the vertex and the edges are the students, right? And now the teacher wants to collect all the test papers and uh, grade them and the calculate the average score. It's exactly how it works from the vertex and the edges when you assign the value to an accumulator, right? For example, it follows the same process. In this case, the teacher is an accumulator, right? So the students would submit their test papers to the students, uh, to, to, to their teacher, by the way, uh, like uh, namely the uh, accumulator, right? And the teacher will agree the test papers and calculate the average. That's the second phase of aggregating, right? First phase, collect the test papers. Second phase, aggregate the value, right? So it's the, uh, pretty much the same thing. Okay, and the foot accumulators, we have two accumulator types. One is a local accumulator that is defined on every each vertex, and the other one is a global accumulator defined on the global memory. You see, this one is outside the graph, right? The global accumulator is outside the graph, and the lo uh, local accumulator is attached to every each vertex. And uh, we also have different uh, aggregation types, right? That is uh, this. The first part of the accumulator, uh, uh, accumulator definition is something like this, right? 
this decides how it aggregates the message when you receive multiple. And also, it's kind of, like I mentioned, it follows the map reviews way, right? At the mapping stage, the vertical edges send the message. And at the aggregation stage or reduce stage, the accumulators aggregate the messages into a new value, right? It's the same thing if you're familiar with uh, map reviews. And then let's say if it is sum accumulate, it will just take a sum, that's intuitive. If, we, if it has all the value two and the receive new value one, three, five, then the new value after aggregation will be 11. And uh, I won't, I don't think we have time to dive into, to talk about a lot of the details here. So I go really fast. So macro cubes will keep the max value, mean will keep, keep the mean value, average keep the average value. It's three, four, right? And then we also have a collection type of accumulators. Like a set will uh, store a unique element set and less will store an ordered list and the map will store the key value store and the uh, heap accumulates um, ordered uh, tuples, right? So those are the collection types. And uh, how does it work? How does it work under the hood? Right. Let's say, assume now we have a query implemented like this. Okay. Now, what it does is like we have a map cube defined globally. And this is a single, single node query, right? We have a map cube defined here. The question we want to answer is what is the age distribution of friend that were registered in 2018? I think we want to aggregate the number of friends into the bucket of an age distribution, right? Like uh, how many people, how many friends are made in their 30s, how many friends are made in their 20s, okay? Now, we start from an input user, that is the input parameter. I assume you're already familiar with the syntax of uh, CC code, so I won't dive into a lot of that. So the first thing it does is a where clause, right? Filter those friends were not made through between uh, 2018, and then, with the accum clause, that means for every each edge that fall into the time window, I want to send the value, send the result to the map, right? Now let's see what exactly happens if we run parallel processing in time graph, right? So first the thing, we, what we do is where clause. So their where clause will be performed on all the edges selected in parallel. Okay, and then all the check-ins happens together. And then this, the third edge will be filtered out, right? And then it comes to the accum clause. Accum, the, all the logics defined under accum clause, they will be performed in parallel for all the edges selected. Okay, so that means for every each of the edge, it will send a key value pair to the age map accumulator defined right here, right? And then age map will collect the key value stores. So that's what happens during the accum phase. So that you can see at the accum phase, the actual value of that global variable, global accumulator is not updated yet. So you, that means you assign a key value store to the map, to the key value store, uh, no, 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 key value pair. The key value pair won't be accessible at that time. Only when the accum phase is finished, we have done processing all the edges, then there is a hidden aggregate phase to aggregate all the key value stores and the key value pairs into the map. Then those values will become accessible, okay? So this is how it works when you write a select statement. And uh, this is the example how you populate a global accumulator. And uh, this is the example how you populate the vertex attached accumulator, namely uh, the local accumulator, right? So let's say, let's don't worry about the detail, too much details. Let's look at this, right? So we have an average accumulator defined over here. And then now, like say, I want to say for 
every each edge selected, I want to populate this average acume on the target node T is the alias of the target node, right? With the value H attribute from the source vertex. What happened here is like a, we do a cube, right? Then from every edge, we send its age value into the bucket of the average cube stored on your T, which is your target vertex. And then there is a hidden stage, aggregate those value into a new value. Then they will become accessible. The hidden stage, it happens after the cube class. Okay, so that means if you have a post acume here, at the post acume stage, you are already be able to access these new values. Okay, it happens right after the acume class. Okay, now I will, I, oh, I think we still have eight minutes. Again, if I got any questions, just post it. I love to answer questions. Otherwise, I will talk about some, uh, uh, some query writing best practices. Some of them are highly, uh, uh, like I, I see that pretty common uh, among the beginners of GCQL writers, okay? So the first thing is we should carefully, so the query writing best practice is really try to align the way engine works, right? For example, now, because the query tends, uh, the, the, the engine, uh, tries to work in the parallel and distributed way, right? We, we, and the, in, in this example, like I say, sometimes when we write a query, let's say, I want to start from a specific vertex, right? And I see a lot of people would write, write a query like this, that is start from the companies and then use a where clause to say, okay, I want my S source vertex equals to the input parameter. Uh, it's kind of like a SQL-like way of writing queries. However, to, to, to the engine, it means I want to start from all the companies and I scan over all of them in order to find the one who has the internal ID equals to the input parameter. Okay, so this will be very expensive. So the best practices here is like, a, we can take a vertex as the input and then we can create a vertex set right out of it. Then that will be, a lot more efficient. And this, so, 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 so the best practice is here is like whenever we start from a, a specific type or we start from all the vertexes, we should think about it again. Is it possible that we can create a smaller vertex set out of the parameters? Or do we really have to start from that many vertexes? This is simple and straightforward. And the next thing I want to talk about is how to handle the hub nodes and the super nodes. Because hub nodes can be a big headache because that will make your partition very, very large, right? Oh, I see someone rose a hand. Uh, um, so uh, I, th I think you can type your question in the chat and I will try to answer it, okay? So, uh, so, so the hub node will slow you down because if we think about the stuff we have learned in previous slides, okay? Uh, how to move this faster. The graph is stored in this way, right? So that means if we have a hub node exists in your graph, that will make that edge segment super large, right? And we also know that if a segment here is super large, yeah, if it is super large, and we know that the process within one segment, they are in sequential, right? That means we one thread will have to process this specific segment like sequentially and that will take you a lot of time, right? And also that make your uh, partitions screwed, screwed. So, so now I want to talk about, because um, so, so um, as hub nodes are not very desirable, then I want to talk about some techniques to mitigate the situation. 
Okay, now I see some uh, new questions. Uh, when we declare local accumulator, does it add to the memory even though we are not using populating values? We declare and then in the graph we have to do some, some, some 10 values. Right, I think the answer is the, the local accumulators, if they are not used, they will, um, I think in C++, you have a way to define something not initialized yet. So it will hold a position, use very tiny amount of memory to tell the system, this is not initialized yet. And once it is populated, you will officially use whatever memory needed. Okay, hope that answers your question. Okay, now let's talk about how to handle the hubnodes. The first thing is avoid starting from it. Let's assume now we have a graph with countries, companies, and the CEO of the, of the company, right? So basically company connects to both CEO and the, the country. And now we want to ask a question, given company A, find all the companies that are in the same country and uh, run by the same CEO, okay? Then in this case, if, if this, the company A is domiciled in US, then we know we have millions and millions of companies in US, right? Then intuitively we can write the query traverse this way. We can have start from the company, go to the both CEO and the country, and then find the whatever that is in common, right? But however, this will have will start from US and which reverse millions and millions of vertexes just to find whoever other companies in the US. It's, it's gonna be very expensive to start from those hub nodes. Alternatively, we can adopt a different path of traverse. So we find the companies who share the same CEO first. That's a, just a several, right? And then we see if they are in the same country or not that will be a lot faster because we have avoided starting from the hub node. That's one strategy to handle that. And the other thing is sometimes introduce hub node or utilizing the hub node in your calculation will make your result less accurate. Okay, I, we only have one minute left. I will finish this and then I think we can conclude the session. And later you can check my slides. And also we have this content available in the series of webinar of the query writing best practices. I do recommend you to take a look there. And I will just finish this slides and then we uh, will done for today, okay? So if sometimes your query doesn't need to be 100 per process, then you can use a sample clause to sample some edges from the hub node. And then sometimes like for entity resolution, using hub node, it will make your query less accurate because what's the point if an email is shared by a, shared by a million people? That is, a, that, that is a noise in the graph, right? Then we can just exclude it with a where clause say, hey, if your audit rate is larger than a million or 100K, then I'm, I'm not traversing it. Or you can use some sampling for less accurate result. Okay. And uh, I think we are about time. Thanks for coming. And uh, you can also feel free to email your questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye.